The book of Esther is classified into wisdom books of the Bible. It belongs to the festival scroll called in Hebrew Megiloth. It is, brethren, fifth of the five books of Megiloth. Now, this book illustrates God's providence, especially dealing with his people. This book normally was read in the Jewish community one month before the Passover. The festival of Purim related to this book started on Thursday with sunset this year. So here we are, one month before the Passover, reading the book that we rarely, if ever, quote in our messages. This year, brethren, I just want to redeem us from not ever reading the book of Esther, just as I redeemed us last year from never reading the book of Ruth. Those two books are both wonderful, coming from very different angles, featuring women of faith in both cases. Now, ironically, the book of Esther had a hard time finding its way into the canon of scripture. Even some of the Jewish sages were doubtful about it. In our Christian era, Martin Luther declared himself a great enemy of the book of Esther, though he included it in his Bible. I'm quoting Martin Luther. He says, I'm so great an enemy to the second book of Maccabees and to Esther that I wish that it had not come to us at all. He has too many heathen unnaturalities. End of the quote. This is Luther said in Table Talk 24. And in one exchange with Erasmus, he said, It deserves to be regarded as non-canonical. Well, Brethren Luther wanted to convert Jews to his form of so-called Christianity, and when he did not succeed, he became a rabid anti-Semite. And since the book of Esther is a story of deliverance of Jewish people, I feel obligated this Sabbath to remind us of a great contribution that truly converted Jews have given to the Church of God, brethren, as we, as true followers of Christ, should appreciate and which this nominal Christianity keep keep silent about, keep silent about the great Jewish contribution. The very first martyr for Christ was a Jew, Stephen. The very first persecution of the followers of Christ, which occurred in Jerusalem, as mentioned in Acts chapter 8, tied with the suffering of Stephen, targeted the Jewish Christians. The commentaries say that 2,000 of them were killed for their faith in Christ right after Stephen was killed. The last faithful apostle who contended for the faith once delivered was the, uh, for the saints was a Jew, the Apostle John. Those who remained faithful to church and didn't apostatize to Gnosticism at the end of the first century, brethren, were mostly Jewish. Most of those Gentiles who came into the church actually received another gospel, Gnosticism, and subverted the true church from within. Those who remained faithful were mostly Jewish, true Christians. Now, when did the Ephesus era of God's church end? Well, it ended once the election of Jewish leaders stopped and a Gentile was elected to lead the remnant of God's people. And in case you think that Jewish contribution to God's church is evidently not in past a is evidently only in past ages, that is, it has been very much relevant in recent church history. I personally feel indebted to some wonderful teachers and examples of Jewish origin to God's true church today, brethren. In fact, in the, it is the book of Esther that reminded me of how much we are indebted to them. When I was an ambassador, we had a great teacher there, Peter Nathan, who taught us the Old Testament survey. He introduced it to us to the custom of Jews when, you know, they read the book of Esther at Purim to loudly protest when the name of Haman mentioned. So our entire class was invited to loudly protest every time he mentioned that infamous name as he read the book of Esther in the class. What a precious experience that was, brethren. Later, I experienced it at the synagogue in Belgrade, and I truly then understood the value of it, and I'm hoping that today you will when we start reading the book of Esther. Now, there was another outstanding teacher, Ambassador Dr. Ralph Levi. Sadly, I didn't get to attend his classes, mostly because the apostate leadership was covertly doing away with exposing us young students to instruction in theology. But he served as a replacement for one of our lectures on New Testament, and it happened that day it was Purim. So Dr. Levi or Levi brought a Jewish national dish called Haman's Ears. It is a sweet that portrays how sweet was the defeat of the of that enemy of God's people, the Jewish people, and I remembered how gladly I ate my piece of that food and how delighted I was that God rescued his people. At that time, I had no idea that I myself was partly Jewish through my ancestry. And I'm thankful that Dr. Levi recorded one of his sermons on e Esther in the church organization where he belongs, so that, you know, I could convey those precious things to you 
to you as well, brethren, because I have been drawing, of course, from various sources that are knowledgeable and more knowledgeable than me. Just like all the Jewish instructors, Dr. Levi has a particular insight into the Hebrew scriptures that the rest of us have plenty to learn from. There was another Jewish instructor, Ambassador Mark Kaplan. His daughter Rebecca and I were classmates, and sadly, again, I never got to attend his classes, but I always remembered the warmth I felt around all those Jewish instructors, brethren. And again, at that time, I was still not aware of any Jewish origin as well. There was always a particular cordiality when I communicated with Rebecca, most likely because the last name Kaplan is actually a Slavic Jewish last name, and I come from the Slavic world. I became a close friend with Peter Nathan, especially as the apostasy of 1995 hit with full force. Even after Ambassador, we remained in touch. In our former church affiliation, I served for a while in the office in Britain, and I remember that I catalogued all of his library. My suggestion was that he named that library Herbert Armstrong Memorial Library, and that was accepted. Dr. Levi invited some of us when we were students to his home, and even though I was not one of his students, he invited me as well. His home was a, you know, with a swimming pool, was beautiful, and even though we would occasionally find ourselves in the same place, such as the Ambassador College Spanish Club, sadly I was never his student. Yet I felt so privileged when some time ago Facebook notified me I had a friend request from him. Now that I know that a part of me is also Jewish, and now that I'm fully aware of the fact that I was a lost Israelite, that virtual contact is all the more meaningful to me. But there is another Jewish person that I have met, although I have never spent much time in his company, who is very important for all of us. That name is Aaron Dean. I met him at a social gathering when I was an ambassador student. I was new to Church of God, and so back then I didn't have a full comprehension of the significance of that outstanding personality. But now, after all that has transpired in the Church of God, in the meantime, I truly understand what a blessing he was and what a blessing he has always been to the Church of God. He typed out the capital work of Herbert Armstrong, you might remember. In fact, Herbert Armstrong, at the end of his life, thanked Aaron Dean because of all so many people who have come in touch with him, Aaron Dean remained faithful to him to the end. And when Dr. Thiel recently consulted me about the apostolic succession and asked for my opinion on it, he told me he listed Aaron Dean on that list. And I said, yes, absolutely. And how much I wish that Aaron Dean, brethren, accepted to be the successor of Herbert Armstrong. Just imagine what the course of the church would have been just imagine how the modern history of God's church would have been different. Now, I can understand why he refused that position, but from this distance, brethren, I greatly regret it. If he accepted, the church would have been subverted from within, just as it was in the first century. But all those apostates would have most likely left and joined their ecumenical Protestant brethren. And we would have been so much blessed with a leader of the Jewish origin. Instead, we had a Gentile who led the Church of God into apostasy, and what is more so, it was a Gentile of a Slavic origin. Well, brethren, with all these individuals of Jewish origin I have just mentioned, remained faithful to God, unlike so many thousands that didn't. As far as I know, they continue to serve God and help God's people wherever they are. They continue to keep God's word, even though now they're in different church organizations. So their contribution to the church of God at large continues to this day. And one day I'm sure they will be unified and all of God's people will be unified. You may wonder, what do all those individuals have to do with the book of Esther? Well, better than everything. Had the evil Haman succeeded in his evil plan, all the Jews would have been exterminated at that time and these converted men would not be among us today. I probably wouldn't be with you today in defiance of Luther's wrong Christian religion. Probably most of the Jews in the entire world at that time, at that point, lived under the Persian Empire. So the events that take place in this book will eventually have to do also with the lineage of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Now we know that, you know, from many of the prophecies that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was going to come from the nation of Judah. And yes, perhaps there were Jews in other parts of the world at that time, but better had the plot succeeded the world would have been left without Savior because Micah chapter 5 says specifically that Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, in Judea. So that was a town in Judea, and we are talking about people who are taken captive from Judea. And so Haman's plot threatens to undermine, threatened actually to undermine God's plan. Now, in the story of Esther, we have Mordecai. We are introduced to Mordecai, the great-grandson of the captive, 
and also Esther. Esther was very attractive personality. She was not just beautiful, the scriptures tell us that she was, but she was also very intelligent and she was also very godly. Now, there are many beautiful people in the world today, but not many who combine all of that together. So, she's an orphan. She was brought up by her cousin Mordecai. The setting of the book of Esther is during the period of captivity of the Jews. This was the Persian period. Now, we know from the Bible history that the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judah and destroyed Jerusalem around 586 BC and took people into captivity. Almost 50 years after his final destruction of Jerusalem, the Babylonian Empire was overthrown by the Medes and the Persians. That is described in the book of Daniel chapter 5. The Persian period continued from that point until 200 years. Now Cyrus the Great was the king of Persia that conquered Babylon and he had issued a decree allowing the Jews to return to Judea and rebuild Jerusalem under the leadership of Zerubbabel. So the story of Esther is set in the Persian Empire in the early 5th century before Christ right around 485 BC. Cyrus decreed that the Jews could return to the Holy Land was issued in 539 before Christ. So the events in the book of Esther took place after 539 before Christ. And a lot of Jews did not return indeed. They were now taken over by Persia and the Persians were much more benevolent than any of the great empires that had dominated the ancient Near East prior to that point. Now that period between when Zerubbabel was allowed to return Jews back out of Babylon to Jerusalem and the time that it's later picked up you know, by the book of Ezra, when Ezra came back, during those several decades in between is when the book of Esther is set. While some Jews returned from Babylon to Jerusalem, many of the Jews stayed in the land of their captivity. The book of Esther picks up the story of those who remained in the Persian Empire. The book of Esther is unique, brethren, because it doesn't have the name of God. God is not directly mentioned uh, and he is not directly pointed out, uh, as many commentaries would tell you. But that, however, is partially true. Now, we won't find the direct mention of God, but there is an inter interesting occurrence. And I'm not sure how it occurs because it's in, in original Hebrew. And the occurrence is that there are five places in the book of Esther, if we're looking in Hebrew, where the name of God is spelled out like something, uh, I think, whether it's the uh, term in Hebrew age or whatever it is, but it's spelled out in an acrostic, in a four-word statement. Uh, that occurs again five times in the book of Esther. An acrostic is a poem in which the, the first letter of each line spells out a word, message, or the alphabet. So while God's name is not directly mentioned, the hidden hand of God is always evident. Now there are a couple of things that tie in to God's name, not being mentioned directly. One is that the book of Esther authorizes Purim, and Purim is the holy day that the Jews celebrate as the time of their deliverance. Now, of course, God didn't command it to be observed as a day of rest, as a holy day. That is also clearly differentiated in the book at the very end, that the decree came from Mordecai and Esther. So there is nothing wrong with that, brethren. Of course, just as Americans have a Thanksgiving day, and also there are other nations who have decree about their special national holidays. So therefore, there is nothing pagan in this, and the Jews were certainly delivered, and it was appropriate to celebrate that occasion. Also, we'll notice a lot of coincidences in the book of Esther. In other words, there are times when God's intervention is very upfront, so to speak. When we read Exodus, for example, there is a series of obvious miracles from God from the start to finish. In the book of Esther, brethren, we clearly perceive the hand of God. In this case, however, the Red Sea wasn't parted, nor did all of the plagues of Egypt come down. There were no all those dramatic signs, and yet God's intervention and God's hand was very evident. God didn't choose to reveal himself in an out front and miraculous way, but he did work through the circumstances to provide for his people. In the book of Esther, some things happen that seemingly make no sense. Esther's life, for example, took a dramatic turn. He was an observant Jewish family. She grew up with certain goals and aspirations and dreams, and yet her life took the turn that no one could have foreseen. So God works through circumstances and that is a part of the lesson of, on faith. God work, could work through circumstances to accomplish things in a way that we would never imagine. So let's start reading the book of Esther. And again, to remind you, just as the Jewish people has the custom, 
Every time you hear them, that infamous name, please make and be free to make loud noise. Loud noise in protest against that evil person. Chapter 1. Before we start reading chapter 1, I'm just going to give you a very short background. The king of Persia, who is introduced in chapter 1, who is called in Hebrew Ahas Ahasers, is better known as Xerxes. In chapter 1, we have a drinking orgy and a king who is really proud and he says, bring my wife and she won't come. So then he goes to the extreme of getting rid of his wife and then he has this, could we call it a beauty contest later and who would be the midst of the empire. So the king was getting ready actually for invasion of Greece. That's why he organized this big party, drinking party and the authenticity of the character Esther is disputed by various so-called scholars but however brethren in this chapter we find description of the royal palace in Shushan and the archaeological excavations of the, that palace exactly match the descriptions of the book of Esther with all of those uh, tiles that were there and the uh, and the various uh, pillars so all the all the description here does match what we read in the book of Esther so the pavement being red and blue, for example, and things like that. So yes, we're talking about authentic events that did happen and somebody did record them. Verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, it, that was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the citadel, that in the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of Persian media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him, when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 days in all. And when the days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days, for all the people who were present in Shushan, the citadel, from great to small, in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were, and here is the description that exactly matches the archaeological excavations in verse 6, there were white and blue linen curtains fastened with cords of fine linen and purple and silver rods and marble pillars, and the couches were of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise and white and black marble. All of that was found by archaeologists, so we are talking about authentic events. Verse 7, And they served drinks in golden vessels, each vessel being different from the other, with royal wine in abundance, according to the generosity of the king. In accordance with the law, the drinking was not compulsory, for so the king had ordered all the officers on his household that they should do according to each man's pleasure. So everybody was drinking as much as they wanted to. And also in verse 9 we find that Queen Vashti also made a feast for the women in the royal palace, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. So you see, after seven days of heavy drinking, the king now ordered the queen to come, which is in verse 10. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Bistra, Harbona, Bikra, Abathra, Zethar, and Karkas, seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen, Wa Queen Vashti before the king, wearing her royal crown, in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials, for she was beautiful to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, brought by his eunuchs. Therefore the king was furious, and his anger burned within him. Then the king said to the wise men who understood the times, for this was the king's manner toward all who knew law and justice, those closest to him being Karshena, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Meres, Mersena, and Memukan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who had access to the king's presence and who ranked highest in the kingdom, what shall we do to Queen Vashti according to law because she did not obey the command of the king Ahasuerus brought to her by the eunuchs? Now, this is not really the time to make such a decision, is it, brethren? It is a drinking party after all, but, verse 16, Memukan answered before the king and the princes, Queen Vashti has not only wronged the king, but also all the princes and all the people who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will become known to all women, so that they will despise their husbands in their eyes when they re report King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought in before him, but she did not come. Now, you might just understand, brethren, that was a very sensitive issue because 
what of the leaders, you know, uh, of the, in the capital are doing does affect the rest of the country. That is the case and true for every single country. Of course, including the United States of America, you know, the fashion of the, of the first lady and the fashion of the president and so on and so forth does affect the rest of the nation, as you all very well know. Verse 18. This very day, the noble ladies of Persian media will say to all the king's officials that they have heard of the behavior of the queen. Thus, there will be excessive contempt and wrath. If it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out from him, and let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it will not be altered, that Vashti shall come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. Now when the king's decree, which he will make, is proclaimed throughout all the, his empire, for it is great, all wives will honor their husbands, both small and both great and small. And the reply pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the words of Memukan. Then he sent letters to all the king's promises, to each province in its own script, and to every people in their own language, that each man should be master in his own house and speak in the language of his own people. Chapter 2. Now, in chapter 2, the king comes back from this, uh, shall we say, military endeavor. We remember also from the book of Daniel that the Persian Empire was prophesied in the Bible. Now, the king put together a huge army, brethren. That was why he organized that big alcoholic orgy in chapter 1. He put the, a huge army and they marched on Greece. But they never made it across the Dardanelles because the king put a pontoon bridge, nevertheless. However, a great storm came and most of his army never made it across. It was one fiasco after another. So the king came back to Persia and, of course, he was not really in a good mood. That is what, in verse 1, it says, after these things refers to, refers to his military maneuvers against Greece. And it refers to the fiasco that the Persian army sustained against Greece. Now, he thinks about Vashti all of a sudden. And since his advisors led him to the scheme against her when he was drunk, now they know he'll be looking for someone to blame. So they come up quickly with a new idea, a beauty contest for a new queen. Verse 1. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan the citadel, into the women's quarters, under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given them. Then let the young women who please the king be queen instead of Vashti. Now, this thing, of course, pleased the king, and he did so. And now in verse 5, we have the turning point in the book as we are introduced to the men, and uh, the men of, of the name Mordecai. And we can say he is one of the main, if not the main character of the story. Verse 5, in Shushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Yair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. So you see, Mordecai was of the tribe of Benjamin, but the house of Judah, brethren, nationally, did include an element of Benjamin. We know that from the Bible history, of course, and from being aware of the identity of Israel. You see, that's also, again, part of the key of David. And unless we understand the identity of Israel, and unless we understand the Bible history, brethren, we will not be able to understand the book itself. Now, Mordecai was obviously related to the first king of Israel, Saul, who was also of the tribe of Benjamin. Because we see the same family line because where Shimei is mentioned, he's mentioned in Second Samuel, chapter 16, verse 5, when it says, Now, with, when King David came to Bahurim, there was a man from the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera, coming from there. He came out cursing continuously as he came. So, we see here is uh, that family mentioned. In Nehemiah, chapter 7, verse 7, uh, the very name Mordecai, He's mentioned, he's mentioned by name. He must have been old, quite old, when he, if he returned to Judea with Zerubbabel. And there are references to Mordecai also in Ezra 2 2 and as well as in Ezra 3 12. But in Nehemiah 7 7, he's mentioned by name. It says, Those who came with Zerubbabel were Yeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Ramiah, Nohamani, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispereth, 
big Y, Nehum and Banach. Now interestingly, Josephus, the famous uh, Jewish Roman historian, he refers to Mordecai as Esther's uncle. But brethren, he was not. In Serbian translation of Esther and in other translations, you may find that he was that Esther was actually the uh, daughter of his uncle. So the two were cousins. So the Bible says, you know, they were cousins. But, you know, Mordecai was obviously older than her. And he was like an uncle figure. So he is very protective of her. So that's why perhaps you'll find in the Bible that he's called her uncle. But they were cousins. Now in verse 6, it says, Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter. So it is very clear that they are cousins, even in this uh, New King James translation. So he brought Hadassah, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as her own daughter. Now in English it says lovely and beautiful. In Serbian it gives more extensive description that she was of a beautiful face, of a beautiful stature, and uh, very uh, seeming to behold. Verse 8, So it was when the king's command and decree were heard. And when many young women were gathered at Shushan, the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, that Esther also was taken to the king's palace, into the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. Well, brethren, being in custody obviously meant that Esther didn't go to the royal palace on her own volition. Now imagine how desperate both Mordecai and Esther had felt when the soldiers showed up and took Esther to the palace. She must have been scared. Mordecai must have been worried. Verse 9, Now the young women pleased him, the young woman that is, pleased Haggai, the custodian of the women. So the young woman, meaning Esther, pleased him, and she obtained her his favor. So he readily gave beauty preparations to her, besides her allowance. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. Now, according to the Persian law, brethren, back then, uh, one was not obligated to or required to reveal his origin or family. So, Esther, Esther's privacy in that case, or privacy, was respected. But, brethren, whether there is <laughs> privacy respected or not, sooner or later, the identity of true people of God will be revealed, and there will be no privacy at all. Verse 11, And every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. So you see, Mordecai was certain that Esther had to get out of there. But time went by and she still, you know, was still held in the royal palace. And so he was really getting worried and wondering, why is God allowing this? Verse 12, Each young woman's turn came to go into King Ahasuerus after she had completed 12 months preparation, according to the regulations for the women, for thus were the days of their preparation appointed, six months with oil of mirth, and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king, and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening she went, and in the morning... She returned to the second house of the women, to the custody of Shashagas, the king's eunuch who kept the concubines. She would not go in to the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. Now, when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abigail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go in to the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Ahas, to King Ahasuerus, into his royal palace, in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebet, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. 
So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So brethren, now we see the king was now, you know, in a great mood. So now he has a beautiful and, 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 and wonderful new queen. So of course he made, what else, but another feast. It seems that this queen Ahasuerus is really delighted in feasting all the time. And uh, from what we read here, he obviously delighted in drinking much wine. It seems to me like there was always a cup of wine ready for him. Verse 18, Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther, for all his officials and servants, and he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. When virgins virgins were, were gathered together a second time, Mordecai sat within the king's gate. He obviously had no idea what happened. Now Esther had not revealed her family and her people, just as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthan and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. Uh, from the Serbian translations, I dis- deduced that these two brethren were the doorkeepers at night. So basically, they were the only ones who had access to the king at night, and they were plotting to, king the ki- to kill the king. So the matter in verse 22 became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on a gallows. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. And this event being recorded now in Chronicles was a crucial thing, brethren, for events that will succeed in the following chapters. Chapter 3. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamedatha the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. So, brethren, coincidentally, this evildoer is promoted. Now, who is this man? He is the Jew hater, the Agagite. Now, Agag come from Amalek. Amalek was one of the subgroups of the nation of Edom. And you probably better know from the Bible history that Edom was the nation that was and is implacably opposed to Israel historically and even down unto our day. The Amalekites were the worst of the worst. They were vicious and violent. So vicious and violent that many of us in this day and age probably will not be able to understand why. They were out for the blood of Israel and later of the Jewish nation. And this horrible evildoer comes from Amalek. He is an Agagite from that subgroup of the nation of Edom. Now, in connection to Mordecai's ancestry, we have read in the previous chapter that Mordecai is Benjamite. Now, we read, you know, we read the name Kish in his ancestry. Kish was a common name in one branch of the family of Benjamin. Kish was actually Saul's father. Now, the name Kish is used several times in that line. So, Mordecai might have been a direct descendant of Saul or a descendant of a collateral line. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1 to 3, we are going to read what was Saul, the first king, commanded, the first king of Israel, united Israel, commanded to do. 1 Samuel 50, verse 1. Saul was commanded by God to destroy Amalek. Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both men and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. That was a command. But in verse 9, we read, brethren, that Saul spared the king of Amalek, Agag. And therefore, there was a particular Amalek that escaped, and that was Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And apparently some of his family escaped with him. So now, you know, we pick up the story later, centuries later, and we find a certain Benjamite, 
perhaps a direct descendant of the king Saul, and, but certainly of that family, and we find this Agagite. All of king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman. <laughs> For so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily and he would not listen to them that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's word would stand. Speaking of endurance, you see, to test his endurance. We spoke about endurance a couple of Sabbaths ago. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. So brethren, Mordecai refuses to bow knee to this evildoer, probably insisting that he will keep the second commandment he probably won't bow down in his, as a sign of worship. So he refuses to bow down to this evildoer who parades now himself in this egotistical way through the city of Shushan, the capital of the greatest empire of the time. Verse 5. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. So this Agagite, you see, found out Mordecai was a Jew and he hated all the Jews. Verse 6, but he disdained, disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman <laughs> sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Per, that is, the Lot, before Haman <laughs> to determine day and month until it fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Now, brethren, casting lots was basically rolling dice. However, in this case, they cast only one per, only one dice. So Haman was going to choose his lucky day. He rolled the dice for a month and for a day, and then his, this evil man goes to the king. Verse 8, then Haman... <laughs> said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws... Look at this now, brethren. This is, sounds like describing us. Their laws are different from all other peoples and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not, is it, not fit, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed... And I'll pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. So the king, you know, took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, <laughs> the son of Hamedata the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, <laughs> The king said to Haman, The money and the people are given to you to do with them as seems good to you. Well, brethren, in the Bible, the signet has a tremendous symbolic significance. It is a stone or metal carving with the image, the head of a king or an aristocrat, and the person who controlled the signet would take the signet ring and press the signet down on a glo glob of hot wax. And kings in those days didn't really care too much about day-to-day -day business, so they would just delegate others to do things for them. So with this ring, this Agagite could stamp any document with the official royal seal and make it a decree, or we, we call it in our, in our day, executive order, if you wish. So this hater of the Jews now utilized the signet to bring forth the decree which says, DEATH TO ALL THE JEWS! And he does it in a very deceptive manner, brethren, because notice, he doesn't even name who those people are. He tells the king, I'll put money in your treasury. And then he says, there is a group of people, you know, unnamed, group of people unnamed, and they do not follow your laws. They are not loyal subjects. Well, brethren, this has often happened in the history of God's people, as they have had this same charge brought against them. In fact, similar charges may, you know, be brought against us in the near future. 
you're bad Europeans. You're not submitting to the laws of Europe, United States of Europe. You're against the ecumenical Christian religion. You're against our, you're against our president. Brethren, what is this evildoer, the hater of the Jews? He is a prototype of the coming European dictator whom we suspect to be Karl Theodor II Gutenberg. One of these days, or if, not, or if not him, somebody else. So this is a prototype of a European dictator, the first beast of Revelation 13. So indeed, it is very appropriate and great that we protest in advance yeah, on this very Purim, because this is now the second day of Purim, by the way, in our calendar. So it is very, very, very appropriate that we protest in advance, and that we call out his name in advance as a witness to Jewish people, all the house of Israel today, and all the church of God around the world, and all the nations who want to heed the word of God, brethren. We are protesting against the coming European dictator beast who is going to destroy God's people, both spirit-led Israel and those people who are Israelites by their flesh. So anyway, did you real, do you realize how subtle he is, this prototype of this coming European beast? There is a group of people, no name, you know, then verse 12, then the king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the first month. Notice the date, brethren, 13th day of the first month, a day before the Passover. So on the 13th at night begins the Passover. And a decree was written according to all that Haman commanded. To the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, to the officials of all people, to every province according to its script, and to every people in their language, in the name of King Ahasuerus, it was written and sealed with king's signet, with his signet ring. Well, brethren, the scribes, of course, copied this decree one day before the Passover on the 13th day of the first month. Oh, what a wonderful time, you know. And now they're given, all the subjects around the Persian Empire, 11 months to get ready for the annihilation of the Jews. Eleven months. Look look how subtle, how perfidious that is, brethren. Eleven months so that everyone would know when to attack them and to destroy them. So the main this main perpetrator, Agagite, thought he came, you know, with his lucky day. Verse thirteen. And the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. A copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province being published for all people that they should be ready for that day. The courier couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan, the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down <laughs> to drink. But the city of Shushan was perplexed. Well, no wonder, brethren, was perplexed. You know, the capital of the empire was perplexed, scratching their heads over this decree. What? What they're going to? They're going to kill all the Jews in one day? What in the world? What is? You know, what in the world is this? And meanwhile, you know, this relaxed king is drinking and enjoying life. How, what a wonderful person to be around, you see. <laughs> Just uh, delegate others to do his business. Chapter 4. When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. Well, when the Jews of the capital of empire, obviously, brethren, they were together for the Passover. They had a cloud now hanging over their heads. They're faced with death. Before the next Passover comes around, they're all dead. Verse 2. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, well, she had no idea, you know, she was close in her quarter, she has no idea what the evildoer had plotted. And the queen was deeply distressed, though she wonders why in the world everybody's fasting and weeping and wailing, you know, what's wrong? Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called Hachach, one of the king's eunuchs who, whom he had appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. 
So Hachach went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman... <laughs> that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Hachach returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Hachach and gave him a command for Mordecai. Verse 11, all the king's servants and the people of the king's promises know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. In other words, you know, Esther said, look, it's not as simple as you think. You think he is the king, I'm the queen, so I just go to him and tell him, no, no, no. If one is not called and goes into the inner court to the king, there is only one law, death. And how all of these brethren must have been totally different than what Esther was dreaming about as she was growing up. You know, She was dreaming about a completely different life. But one of the lessons here from Esther's example, yes, she is a heroine of faith, and yet when Mordecai initially approaches her, you see, her immediate reaction is, not one of iron faith. You know, she has the natural reaction initially, and her immediate reaction betrays fear for her own life. Verse 12, so they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Well, that is better in the closer that we get to a mention of God in the book. Mordecai, surely when he said, you know, that relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, he certainly had God in mind, but he doesn't mention God by name. He is alluding to the fact that he had faith God would intervene. And until now, all this time, it was inexplicable to Mordecai why all that it did happen and what for. How many times do we wonder, Benny, why did God let that happen in our lives? Don't we think that Mordecai must have been asking the same question? Don't we think that Esther herself would ask the same question? So now Mordecai thinks, well, maybe the reason my cousin is there is for this very time. And when, he, when we find ourselves in, a, in the midst of a trial, one thing better we must understand is that God only has the solution. God is never in a position to think, oh, what am I going to do now? How do I get my servants out of this position? But no, God only has a solution in mind. It is us, we don't have any solution. And we wonder sometimes where the solution is. It is there. God has it already. He already had it in advance, even for the Mordecai and Esther and the Jews. Verse 15. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My mates and I will fast likewise, and so I'll go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So this is a tremendous declaration of faith. You know, there is a mixture of fear and faith inside of Esther. She looked to what was going on. She realized her life was in danger. And she had that little bit of prodding from her cousin. But brethren, sometimes we get really upset with ourselves, you know. And perhaps this is something to also think in this pre-Passover season. We are too hard on ourselves sometimes when we, when we have health problems or when we have financial problems, where we have, you know, where we have a moment where we, well, let's say, waver a little bit of faith, and we think, well, I'm a member of the Church of God, I, I'm a Christian, and I'm supposed to have faith made out of iron, I'm not supposed to waver. But you see, brethren, it did happen to Esther and others as well. 
when we look into the scripture, not just into the book of Esther, the heroes of faith whom God used reacted exactly this way. You know, often their initial reaction was a human reaction, and it was one that betrayed a certain measure of uncertainty. Remember, God said to Abraham, hey, Abraham, you're going to have a son. <laughs> Sarah, 90 years old. Sarah, 90 years old, you're going to conceive, you're going to bear the son of promise for your husband. <laughs> what happened? She laughed. <laughs> human reaction is always natural to all of us, brethren. So, perhaps one of the lessons we need to draw now in a month before the Passover is don't go just too hard on yourselves. Don't be so strict sometimes about yourselves. And to be honest with you, how often you're far less strict with others <laughs> and you're so strict with yourself. Verse 17. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. So we see here certainly the evidence of faith. You see, and there was this three day and three day and three night fasting period, when she went into the king, she was still fasting because uh, it was the third day when she went in there. So she was fasting, Brendan. We all know that fasting changes things. And that's one of the big lessons in this book. Esther understood that. She didn't just jump straight in. She said, if I'm going to the inn to the king, we are going to fast for three days. And I'm very glad that, I'm very glad that as, as a community, we do have this practice to fast once a month, collectively, and individually, of course. Because I'll remind you in Matthew 6, 17, Jesus Christ said to his disciples, But you, when you fast, not if, brethren, it doesn't say if you fast, it says when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, and certainly that should be for us more than once a year on the Day of Atonement. Fasting is one of those things that we need to use from time to time as one of our spiritual tools to draw us close to God, brethren. Verse 18, So that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So, of course, fasting changes things. So, you know, Queen Esther went in there with her royal garment and stuff, and she didn't behave like she was afflicted with fasting. Fasting, brethren, changes things. We have seen that so frequently when we fast that things change. And then, in a sense, it is a pretty small gesture when you think about it. We all need to ask ourselves, when was the last time we fasted indeed? Well, we all know it was last month, our collective fast, and here we are in the last month of the sacred year, the the, uh, the month of Adar. So it's time, it's actually the, the half of the month, and the moon was so beautiful above Serbia last night. We tried to take a shot of it, and Maestro Slobo sent you a shot on over Skype. I'm not sure if you have, if you were able to discern exactly. It was the moon he was targeting. It was a beautiful, it's full moon because it's you know half of the month, and uh, fasting is is the last month. So we need to obviously set another collective fast because it's a month before the Passover. We all need to always ask ourselves when was the last time that we fasted. It is something we need to use from time to time. And, you know, we don't hold it back just for a crisis moment. We need to use fasting from time to time when we don't feel close enough to God. So when was the last time? That's always a question we should have, and it's one of the lessons of this wonderful book. Chapter 5. Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, across from the king's house, while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house, facing the entrance of the house. So you see, after fasting for three days, she goes to see her husband. She must have been scared. Well, you know, sometimes when we think that it was so simple for the Old Testament people, you know, they had faith and all that God had to do was just perform miracles. Well, it wasn't that simple, brethren. Their lives were, in a sense, as complicated as ours in, our, in this world. Now, Esther was most likely terrified. Wouldn't you be? She fasted and she had everybody else fast. And then she would go in. And who knows in what mood the king would be. So she was prepared at that point to accept God's will. If I perish, I perish. So it was, verse 2, when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, that she found favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. And the king said to her, What do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you up to half the kingdom. So he's obviously in a good mood. 
working. I guess he's he was having uh, several cups of wine, you know, through the time. So he's in a good mood. Oh, there she comes, you know, his beautiful wife. Uh, he hasn't seen her for a month. In the <laughs> so, verse five, uh, verse four, that is. So Esther answered. Look how how smart and intelligent that woman is, brethren. Instead of jumping right, you know, and saying, oh, we are threatened, we need to be saved, please do something. No, she does something very smart. She says, if it pleases the king, let the king and Haman come to the... You all seem to be very quiet there, or perhaps I'm not hearing. Well, perhaps we're just too loud here, or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> anyway... Let them come today to the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, Bring Haman quickly. <laughs> that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman. <laughs> Excellent. That's what I want to hear. So the king and Haman went to the banquet that Esther had prepared. Excellent. Please unmute your microphones and be loud. At the banquet of wine, the king said to Esther, What is your petition? Is It shall be granted to you. What is your request? Up to half the kingdom. It shall be done. So, brethren, you see, she invited the king to her apartment for a meal, a special meal, as well as the king's favorite, this, this horrible evildoer, because, of course, Esther was smart. Well, we all know, and it's true, it's not written in the Bible, but we all know, especially us men, that the way to man's heart is through his stomach. And that's true. That's very much true. So Esther indeed knew that. So she knew King's favorite food. But, you know, he was obviously aware that she would not risk her life just to invite him for a dinner. So, you know, every once in a while he keeps asking her, okay, what is your petition? You know, what is this for? Verse 7, then Esther answered and said, my petition and request is this. Now, here is again, she's again being very intelligent. If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition to, and fulfill my request, then let the king and Haman come to, come to the banquet which I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I'll do as the king has said. Verse 9, oh, how glad he is. So, Haman... Wow. Excellent, even dogs are participating Great, so Haman went out that day Joyful and with glad heart But when Haman <laughs> Saw Mordecai in the king's gate And that he did not stand or tremble before him <laughs> You see, he wants people to tremble before him What an egoist, what a lunatic Brethren, Karl Theodor to Gutenberg himself It seems, or whatever the Antichrist would be or tremble before him, he would love to, us to tremble before the, the coming European dictator would love to, us to tremble before him. Brethren, we shall not. He was filled with indignation against Mordecai. Oh, yes, indeed. I'm, I can only see a catalog of heretics, you know, in, in the office of the cult or to Gutenberg or whoever will be the Antichrist. Catalog of the heretics around the world. You know, and all of our, all of our uh, photos and our uh, short biographies, you know, uh, was born in such and such place, doing such and such, you know, offending the great European president. Anyway, so he's, you know, he, he's so glad. Uh, but verse 10, nevertheless, even though he's so angry, nevertheless, Haman <laughs> restrained himself and went home. And he sent and called for his friends and his wife Zeresh. So, brethren, he is so glad. You know, the king had promoted him. Now, the queen invited him for a special meal. But all that didn't mean to him because, you know, Mordecai ruined his day. Verse 11. Then Haman. <laughs> told them of his great riches, the multitude of his children, Everything in which the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the officials and servants of the king. Moreover, Haman said, <laughs> Besides, Queen Esther invited no one but me to come in with the king to the banquet that she prepared. And tomorrow I am again invited by her along with the king. 
Yet all this avails me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. So Brendan, his wife and friends, of course, advised him not to worry. Just hang Mordecai and everything will be great. Verse 14. Then his wife Zeresh and all of his friends said to him, Let the gallows be made fifty cubits high. And in the morning suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged on it. Then go merrily with the king to the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman. <laughs> So he had the gallows made. All right. Now we come to chapter 6. And in chapter 6, brethren, we see God's hands involved again. Another coincidence. That very night, the king could not sleep. There was no television and no internet back in those days. So what would he do? Listen to the Chronicles. Meanwhile, Esther and all the Jews were fasting and... Was this perhaps an answer to their fasting and prayer? Why not? Verse 1. That night the king could not sleep. So one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles. And they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigatana and Teresh. Two of the king's eunuchs. The doorkeepers who had sought to lay hands on king Achaserus. Then the king said... What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. So the king said, You know, so he's not marveling. A man who did such a great thing saved my life, and he wasn't honored at all. And he couldn't sleep, of course. Now it was the dawn, it was the morning. So the king said, Who is in the court? Now, Haman... <laughs> had just entered the other outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. So, brethren, here we have a case of a perfect timing. You know, this evildoer came to the court to ask king's permission to hang Mordecai, but the king, baffled by the fact that he didn't honor the man who saved his life, had a question ready for the person who had his signet. So he was looking for a good advice now on how to honor Mordecai. So verse 5. The king's servant said to him, Haman is there. <laughs> Standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So, Haman, come in. <laughs> and the king asked him, what shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Now, Haman... <laughs> thought in his heart, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? Verse 7, and Haman answered the king, <laughs> for the man whom the king delights to honor, let the royal robe be brought which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on its head. Then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of the one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor, then parade him on horseback through the city square, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Verse 10. Then the king said to Haman, <laughs> Hurry! Take the rope and the horse, as you have suggested, and do so for Mordecai the Jew, who sits within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. So, verse 11, so Haman <laughs> took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city square, and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate. But Haman hurried to... <laughs> hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. When Haman... <laughs> told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him... His wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. 
while they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs came and hastened to bring Haman. the banquet which Esther had prepared. Chapter 7. So the king and Haman <laughs> went to dine with Queen Esther. And on the second day at the banquet of wine, of course the banquet of wine, what else would a king do but have the banquet of wine? The king again said to Esther, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Up to half the kingdom, it shall be done. Then Queen Esther answered and said. Now, notice, brethren, something in verse 3, please. Something that we haven't noticed before. And uh, it's very important. I'll bring your attention to that later. In a minute. The Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king... She doesn't say in king's sight, you see? She says, in your sight, O king. This is very important, brother. This is a very important moment. This is the most tense moment in all of the book. If I found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. Well, brother, this banquet of wine was a mishtech in, in, in Hebrew. It was a wine feast that was going on. So they had been steadily drinking and, you know, they're feeling very good and the food was wonderful. And this is, in a sense, the most tense moment in the entire book because Esther did notice, answered and said, if I have found favor in your, your sight, O king. This is the only place in the book where she uses the second person to talk to the king. She, you know, is looking him right in the eye. That particular moment when everybody's feeling good, he has had a wonderful meal and she does something that is very audacious. And she doesn't say, if I have found favor in the king's sight, third person, no, brethren. She says, if I have found favor in your sight. And it is pretty daring, brethren. And if it pleases the king, she's trying to tell him that this is an emergency situation and please, I need you to become involved in this. Therefore, she's that daring and she's that audacious. If it pleases the king, let my life be given me at any, at my petition and my people at my request. And then she continues, verse 4, For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. Now, of course, king never heard of this. He must have been totally shocked. Verse 5, So King Ahasuerus answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. <laughs> so, Haman <laughs> was terrified before the king and queen. Verse 7. Then the king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther, <laughs> pleading for his life, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. Well, the king didn't say even a thing, brethren, but the evildoer, by the look of the king's face and the king's eyes, he could have, you know, uh, exactly foresee that, no, this is not going to end very well. And verse 8 when the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the bank of the wine, Haman had <laughs> had fallen across the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, Will he also assault the queen while I am in the house? And the word left as the word left king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. <laughs> You see the soldiers standing there, brethren, didn't even need any further instruction. They understood what was happening. And then verse 9. Now Harbona, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman <laughs> made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. <laughs> Then the king said, hang him on it. 
So now time to to shout even with greater joy is so verse ten they hanged Haman. <laughs> They hanged Haman on the gallows and he that he had prepared for Mordecai that the king's wrath subsided. Well, brethren, we noticed how things have changed. Haman's was king's favorite person and no doubt all of king's eunuchs were in good relations with him. But, you know, when this one saw how things changed, he quickly changed the sides and he informed the king about the gallows ready for Mordecai, the man who saved king's life. So, brethren, people are like that. That's human nature. They will quickly change political sides or any other sides when they see it would be in their interest. We have seen this in the recent American elections, how some so-called Republicans quickly changed their sides and how quickly from staunch supporters of their president became almost their enemy, his enemy. Anyway, chapter 8. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, <laughs> the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, <laughs> and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. Wow! Well, what a great king, brethren, huh? <laughs> what do you say? You know, but just pass, just pass me another drink and let someone else take care of business. You know, why don't you... Why don't you take care of this mess now, Mordecai? You know. So now, verse three, Esther spoke again to the king, fell down at his feet, and implored him with tears to counteract the evil of Haman the younger guy <laughs> and the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. Well, the problem was still there, brethren. The decree was in power to exterminate all the Jews throughout the Persian Empire. And the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, if it pleases the king. You see, she's not saying you, if it pleases you now. So she's not <laughs> saying the king. If it pleases the king and if I have found favor in his sight and the thing seems right to the king and I am pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, <laughs> the son of Hamedatha the Agagite, which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman. <laughs> and they have hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay the, his hands on the Jews. You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews, as you please, in the king's name, and seal it with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. So, brethren, isn't that beautiful king? You know, passing the bucket seems to be <laughs> his primary occupation. That seemed to be the primary occupation of, 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 of him and probably many other kings. You know, one day he issues the decree to have all the Jews killed on a certain date. Now he says, look, I'll not be bothered about all of that. You know, come up with a solution that you deem right and uh, it'll be fine. Verse 9. So the king's scribes were called at the time. In the third month, which is the month of Sivan, this was just a little more after Pentecost, as we can see from this uh, account here in verse 9. On the 23rd day, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews, the satraps, the governors, and the princes of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces in all, to every province in its own script, to every people in their own language, and to the Jews in their own script and language. And he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus, sealed it with the king's signet ring, and sent letters by couriers on horseback, riding on royal horses, bred from swift steeds. By these letters the king permitted the Jews, who were in every city, to gather together and protect their lives, to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the forces of any people or province that would assault them, both little children and women, and to plunder their possessions on one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Well, brethren, you see, they couldn't write, well, look, the previous decree was king's mistake. How could he be... Uh, how could, in the world could he write such a stupid decree? So just ignore it and forget about it. No, he couldn't because, you know, uh, the decree was already part of the law of the Medes and Persians. So they phrase it like this, you know. 
uh, the decree to kill all the Jews is there in the law. But what the king didn't mention the first time around is that the Jews have every right to defend themselves. In fact, the king hopes that they will defend themselves. Verse 13, a copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province and published for all people, so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers who rode on royal horses went out, hastened and pressed on by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Shushan the citadel. So Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white, with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. The Jews had light and gladness, joy and honor, and in every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. Then many of the people of the land became Jews, because fear of the Jews fell upon them. So then all of a sudden, the people saw again the way, which way the wind was blowing. You know, look, the queen is a Jew, the prime minister is a Jew. Well, so being a Jew, he's not so bad after all, right? Chapter 9. Now, in the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth thirtieth day, the time came for the king's command and his decree to be executed. On the day that the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, the opposite occurred, in that the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. The Jews gathered together in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought them their harm, and no one could withstand them, because fear of them fell upon all people. And all the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and all those doing the king's work, helped the Jews, because of the, because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. Of course, not fear of God, but, you know, fear of Mordecai. Well, they saw now who was now in charge, you know. Verse 4, For Mordecai was great in the king's palace, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai became increasingly prominent. Thus the Jews defeated all of their enemies with the stroke of the sword, with slaughter and destruction, and did what they pleased with those who hated them. And in Shushan, the citadel, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. Also, Pashadarta, Dalphon, Aspatha, Poratha, Adalia, Aridatha, Parmashta, Arisai, Aridai, and Vajazatha, the ten sons of Haman. The sons of Haman, the son of Hamedatha, the enemy of the Jews, they killed, but they did not lay hand on the plunder. On that day, the number of those who were killed in Shushan, the citadel, was brought to the king, and the king said to Queen Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the citadel, and the 10 sons of Haman. <laughs> what have they done in the rest of the king's promises? Now, what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. Or what is your further request? It shall be done. Then Esther said, If it pleases the king, let it be granted to the Jews who are in Shushan to do again tomorrow according to today's decree and let Hamans... <laughs> and let Hamans' ten sons be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. The decree was issued in Shushan and they hanged Hamans... <laughs> And the Jews who were in Shushan gathered together again on the 14th day of the month of Adar and killed, 14th day was yesterday, brethren, by the way, according to our calendar, and killed 300 men at Shushan, but they did not lay a hand on the plunder. They didn't care about the plunder, they just wanted to get rid of their enemies and finish the job that they couldn't finish the previous day. Verse 16, the reminder of the Jews in the king's promises gathered together and protected their lives, had rest from their enemies and killed 75,000 of their enemies, but they did not lay a hand on the plunder. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th of the month they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day, as well as on the 14th, and on the 15th day, which is today by our calendar, brethren, and on the 15th day of the month they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. 
Therefore, the Jews of the villages who dwelt in the unwalled towns celebrated the 14th day of the month of Adar with gladness and feasting as a holiday and for sending presents to one another. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters to all the Jews near and far who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to establish among them that they should celebrate yearly the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar as the days on which the Jews had rest from their enemies as the month which was turned from sorrow to joy for them and from mourning to a holiday the days should make them days of feasting and joy of sending presents to one another and gifts to the poor so brethren we see now this turn of events first the personal lives of Mordecai and Esther were disrupted why would God allow this to happen they wondered then circumstances proceeded from bad to worse going from the personal level it you know became basically a problem for the entire nation. Esther and Mordecai didn't know how this story was going to end. And when we walk through a cloud, not knowing where to go, what we have got to do, brethren, is just, as I mentioned last Sabbath, is we've got to just walk by faith. You know, we find the number of coincidences which show us the hidden hand of God. There was nothing so dramatic as Exodus. But what we find is the right people who found themselves at the right time, at the right place. You know, the king just couldn't sleep that night. They just happened to open the page in Chronicles about Mordecai saving king's life. And then Haman just happened to be outside. Verse 23, so the Jews accepted the custom which they had begun. So it's obviously a man-made custom. It's very clearly said in the Bible. But again, nothing is pagan about it. There is nothing wrong with, you know, marking it and even joining the Jewish people in celebrating it, brethren. So, accepted the custom which they had begun as Mordecai had written to them because Haman, <laughs> the son of Hamedatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews, of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to annihilate them and had cast per that is the lot, to consume and destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letter that this wicked plot, which Haman had devised, had devised against the Jews, should return on his own head, and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. So they called these days Purim, after the name Pur. Therefore, because of all the words of this letter, what they had seen concerning this matter and what had happened to them, the Jews established and imposed it upon themselves and their descendants and all who would join them, that without fail they should celebrate these two days every year according to the written instructions and according to the prescribed time. For these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation. Brethren, I'm reading you the inspired scriptures. It doesn't say it's a holiday, it's a day of rest. No, it doesn't say so. However, it is in the inspired scriptures as a man-made holiday, obviously for a reason there. They should be, you know, they should remember and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province and every city that these days of Purim should not fail to be observed among the Jews and that the memory of them should not perish among their descendants. Then Queen Esther and the, the daughter of Abigail and with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm his this second letter about Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews, to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus, with words of peace and truth, to confirm these days of Purim at their appointed time, as Mordecai the, queen, the Jew and Queen Esther had prescribed for them, and as they decreed for themselves and their descendants concerning matters of their feasting, uh, of their, sorry, fasting and lament, lamenting. So the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim and it was written in the book. So we have no doubts. It's a man-mandated holiday, but obviously it's a day of feasting and rejoicing, as I'm hoping that you are now feeling delighted and exalted, brethren, by all this. Chapter 10. Finally, King Ahasuerus and the King Ahasuerus imposed tribute on the land and on the islands of the sea, now all the acts of his power and his might and the account of the greatness of Mordecai to which the king advanced him, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second to King Ahasuerus and was great among the Jews and was 
well received by the multitude of his brethren, seeking the good of his people and speaking peace to all his countrymen. Brethren, the book of Esther ends with celebration. Now we know that there is a correlation between the five books of the law with the five books of the Psalms and with the five festival scrolls. Now the fifth book of the Psalms is the time of celebration and it ends up with hallelujah. Just similar to what we find at the end of the book of Esther. God is there brethren, he is going to destroy the enemies of his people and it is a time of great festivity. Psalm 107 which starts this section, the fifth uh, book of Psalms, starts with Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Don't we know that hymn? Yes. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands from the, the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Well, brethren, this is indeed speaking of the second exodus, which we, the continued church of God, restored as the firm doctrine to all the churches of God out there. It's talking about people also entering God's family as glorified sons and daughters. But it is also interested, interesting that the book of Esther is the fifth book of, on the festival scroll, Megiloth, and God appears in that book five times. You know, brethren, sometimes God operates behind the scenes. Now, this book shows us that. In one of his radio programs, Mr. Armstrong said, I'm quoting, the one question is, has God promised to do it in your Bible? If he has, then probabilities, possibilities, feelings, convictions, impressions have absolutely nothing one way or the other to do with it. God has a thousand ways that we know nothing of, of answering and of providing whatever he has promised. We don't need to know how he's going to do it or when. End of the quote. Well, Benning God almost never does it in a way that we expected. I'm sure that you have the same experience as I do. Mordecai and Esther issued the decree in chapter 9 and it was confirmed as the matter of Purim. It was the successor of King Xerxes, by the way, who issued the decree for the return of Jews, which started the countdown to the coming of the Messiah. And the festival of Purim, you see, occurs almost exactly one month prior to the Passover. It is a Jewish national festival. It is not a commanded festival for the church, but it is not a pagan festival either. So it is the festival of Purim that celebrates the outcome of the book of Esther, because God turned things around. And we quoted Romans 8.28 last Sabbath, and I want to remind you, Romans 8.28, All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. We, brethren, do struggle when you know with that at times when we are sick. We struggle with it when we face an unemployment or unemployment crisis. We struggle with it when we have got difficulties in the family and emotional difficulties. But it says so, and it is true. When we are in God's hands, he always makes sure that things come out for the best long run. Now, of course, the key for us is to stick with the program, to hold on, to be faithful to Him. You know, God brings His people step by step through everything that they face. Brethren, don't forget, God is loyal to the covenant. He sacrificed His own Son. He sac Jesus Christ became flesh as a husband of the Old Testament, Old Covenant with Israel, to free Israel to be married again. God is loyal to the covenant. We all have entered into the had entered into the covenant at the time of our baptism, and in one month we are going to renew that same covenant. God is loyal. We entered already the new covenant. It hasn't been consummated yet to the fullest. It will be when we become when we become fully spirit. But we are now in the process. We are in the new under the new covenant, and God is loyal to the covenant. Are we? Are we? There is a payoff. We have to be faithful even when we cannot see the outcome of the things that are taking place in our life. In our lives. And when we are in those circumstances, it is not a question of when. It is, sorry, when we are in those circumstances, we cannot really see what is the end of the matter. Then it is a question of when and not if. 
and I didn't plan to tell you this, but I will at the end. Brethren, soon, the prototype of this evildoer is going to appear. And I'll say once more just his name, just so that you can protest loudly. The prototype of Haman... is soon going to appear on the world scene, brethren. That will be our next test. Great test, and I'm afraid many in the Church of God who at large are going to fail that test. We, as a Philadelphia remnant, hopefully will be imbued by the power, brotherly, brotherly love for one another, and by the power of God to withhold the assaults that we are going to be undertaking by the coming European beast. We'll be lied about, we'll be maligned, our pictures will show all over the blogs, internet. Our names will be all over the headlines, brethren, because we will be the enemies of that evil person. So, it's coming. But when he, when he comes, we have to understand again that we have to stick with God. We have to remain faithful to Him. Just as God was faithful with Mordecai and Esther and the Jews, He'll be faithful to our covenants with Him. He'll bring us, his people, step by step through everything that we face. And again, when Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg or somebody else appears, we will find ourselves in difficult and different circumstances. It will not be a question of when. It will, you know, it will not be a question of even if. We know the answer to those questions. The when, we'll know it's near. We know it's almost the end. And, but it will never be the question of if. God will stand with us. Will walk us through all those trials. And hopefully, brethren, with his supernatural help, we will be able to withstand, escape all these horrible things that are going to come upon the world and stand before the Son of the Man. And not only will we stand before him, but we are going to come down with him, brethren, and destroy all the enemies of God's people in this satanic world. And finally, establish the glorious kingdom of God.